What nature has done for millions of years, I suppose, is assemble molecules, uh, those kinds of molecules which are basic, basic components of fat called lip lipids. These kinds of molecules, hydrocarbon type molecules, assemble naturally in uh, biological substances, in plants. And so it's well known that they can form, even form thin films, often freestanding films. When we entered the area of pursuing these self-assembly processes, what we did that was different was to cause the molecules to self-assemble on a flat surface of interest. Something nature wouldn't do simply because that flat surface was of no interest in biological processes. Jacob turned to silicon and Ralph and I, when we started originally, turned to gold. Not purposefully, but discovering by accident that in fact you could self-assemble molecules that on gold surfaces. So the self-assembly itself is nature's trip for millions of years. Our part was to discover it in a new uh, situation that we created. We created the pieces and nature did the rest. What we've done now is we've like said that, you know, the, the properties that we need are things that can be, uh, in, you know, instill, you know, basically constructed in, in, in objects by design. We can manipulate things purposefully as to composition, form, dynamics, etc., and, and use that beneficially towards, you know, towards uh, uh, particular desired applications. And, and that's the part of it that I think that's become particularly enabling. Um, from a technology perspective. It is possible to uh, affect a design at, at a very high level and classes of materials which, you know, would have been like Im impossible to envision, you know, working with, you know, in that context. So there's been a lot of evolution. I don't mean to trivialize all the contributions I think go into it, but, you know, we started with like understanding surfaces and interfaces. And then we, you know, based on lots of different contributions, went to how to do, you know, fabrication and patterning. And, you know, and then people were thinking top down, bottom up approaches to doing fabrication. And, and as you do all that, you know, the, the footprint gets bigger and bigger, like all the time, you know, and, and what would have been like an, an audacious, impossible aspiration, you know, like at the outset actually becomes not that, you know, unimaginable as the sophistication of what you're doing just expand, you know, in, in result of the work. Sam's was like a start in that process, but it's really uh, gone far and beyond, I, I think, uh, where, you know, we started in, in 1980, at least like, you know, where, where I started in 1980. Surfaces are so important and so ubiquitous throughout technology and human use that wherever you can find a surface, you can ask a question, which can be scientific or it can be technological. And self-assembled model layers are helpful to you in understanding that. And I think it's probably that that is ultimately the the key to use of these things because what they do is to make it possible to vary the properties of surfaces at command relatively simply. You simply dip the surface that you're interested in in a solution containing the molecules that absorb on the surface and self-assembly will generate the structure you're interested in. The limits to self-assembled model layers are that most of the molecules that are used right now are pretty simple molecules. Now you can make more complicated ones, but when you make more complicated ones, then the technology becomes more complicated. And one of the virtues is that we, in particular, really believe as a principle of doing research that to make good science into good technology, it's easiest if everything is very simple. So there's a lot to be said for just thinking about simplicity as a guiding principle in research. And if you're trying to make something that's modified surface properties at 2,000 degrees, or you're trying to make uh, surfaces that are uh, amenable to um, 
extreme x-ray exposures or whatever, that's hard to do and that's going to require more work. I claim that our research, what we are doing, is leading itself. What I mean, you start with something, eventually you discover something that you didn't think about. I mean, you, you, you had some idea, but not necessarily what came out of it. And this leads you to the next step. And then again, it can go in different directions. So actually the research leads itself if you have an open mind. The best thing that can happen is that something doesn't work according to your original idea. Good things come out of this, what is called serendipity. But you have to have a prepared mind, and of course, if you don't work on something, you cannot discover. You have to, to work on something that may lead you to the discovery. But you cannot plan the discovery. But once it's there, you have to recognize it. And then you have to work hard to prove that what you think is there, it's indeed there. And it's not a fake. All this is a game, actually. We you have to let people playing, you know. There are different kinds of science. You can work for a certain purpose, to make a certain device, you know, applied science. And this is, is okay, it's fine. And you, you get also satisfaction if you manage to do something useful. But to discover something new or to come across something you didn't expect is very exciting. And so we are actually, I think that all my life I was playing science. And uh, this was uh, more or less a hobby. The work was only how to get the means to do the hobby. I think forward-looking, I, I think the applications in, in biomedical contexts are really quite interesting. And they're, they're the ones that I'm most interested in at this point in time. When you start working with living things, you know, the first thing you have to uh, come to understand is they, they do have you know, a mind of their own. And almost everything that you can do you know, to perturb a system, you know, perturbs the system. It's very complex. Their work transformed surface science and has led to applications shaping all of our lives on a daily basis in areas from medical diagnostics to semiconductor devices. Please welcome onto our stage Ralph Nuzo, Jakob Sagiv and George Whitehouse. White guys. <laughs> Wow, thank you so much and congratulations. Thank you. It's been amazing just watching it, isn't it? So this is a fascinating area, but self-assembled monolayers are a new thing to quite a lot of us. So, Ralph, just take us briefly through what these are, because we find them in nature all the time. Um, I, th I think the easiest way to understand it is, um, you know, we're interacting with... Uh, um, molecules all the time, and, and, and for any given surface exposed to you know, a flux of molecules, there's a rate by which they come on, and a rate which which they come off. And as and as the the video showed, if if you pick those structures carefully enough, you can make things stay, you know, for longer periods of time, you know, based on what the bonding interactions are. And if the structures are correct, you could also make them self-organize to generate, you know, another hierarchical level of, of, of structure. In much the same way as, uh, you know, the, the amphiphiles that form a, the membrane of a, of a cell, you know, form that element of a structure, you know, via innate thermodynamically driven processes. In, in that case, you know, the assembly is occurring against an aqueous interface. You know, they're, they're designed to organize against water as the underlying substrate. And I think that's the general idea. There's always this hierarchy of, of interactions that dictate, you know, uh, you know, the, you know, the transitions between, you know, order and disorder. And, and in this particular uh, uh, area, uh, to, to organize structure of matter across different lake scales in a two-dimensional context. And in more recent science, to actually try to take that and, l and raise it into the third dimension as well. So I guess it's taking the science of wetting and sticking <laughs> and elevating it to uh, be able to fabricate all sorts of devices. That was like my 
you know, entryway in, into it. And, uh, and uh, based on uh, graduate work that I did when I was a student with George, we were always trying to understand properties of interfaces formed with polymeric materials. And um, those were very complicated systems because it was n not necessarily an easy thing to generate a type of structure which would be stable against, like, for example, transport of functional groups into the bulk of the material, you know, as, as, one, as, as, you know, as one example. And, and if you had a, a given property, it was also very hard from an analytical perspective. And I think that goes back to the last presentation we saw, like how you do the characterization to know, you know, what exactly is the, you know, the precise details of the molecular structure and contact um, that generates the macroscopic property you see. You know, why is the drop this shape, and you know, and how do the interactions that mediate it, you know, generate that as a as a thermodynamic outcome? Hmm. Now, Jakob, um, we we were chatting yesterday, weren't we, um, yes. about maybe a book that was on your boss's desk. What was it that that got you into to monolayers? Why did that excite you? So, uh, chem as chemists, we are. Uh, used to have, as I explained to you, uh, some liquid in a one beaker, let's say, another liquid in another beaker, we pour together and boom, something happens. Molecules react with one another, give some color or something. But these are bulk <laughs> materials. You mean huge amounts of molecules. As chemists, our dream would be that we can handle molecules one by one. This is what happens probably in the living body. I mean, the living body, you do not mix big liquids. The reactions are precise. So we would like to learn how to handle molecules, how to make structures, not just synthesize molecules. This is what organic chemistry has been doing for a long time. But to make structures beyond the molecule with a certain architecture that can provide certain functions, we didn't know. So how can we do this? So apparently, the, uh, the key to this is to use interfaces. I mean, surfaces are actually interfaces unless you are working in vacuum, because you have always, let's say, a boundary between a solid and a liquid, or a solid and a gas. So there are molecules in the liquid, molecules in the gas, and the interface, this is where molecules can assemble, they can absorb. And this is where you have the possibility to get them organized and handle them. So what our monolayers are, are actually layers of single molecules. So in this sense, we are down to one molecule, but we have a large area. In order to have even more control, you have to do what has been done next, this is patterning. I mean, you can modify the surface in a different specified locations according to a plan. Mm. And then you can construct actually architectures. And this was the original idea. So again, the question, what is this good for? So you think that if you are able to do this, eventually something very exciting will come out. Mm. So Is it wasn't actually very good for your career, was it, at the time? Because you fell it, in it, love it, with monolayers. Uh, no, it, it has never been good for my career. <laughs> except <laughs> in this now. moment. <laughs> except in this moment. <laughs> but you see, it came some 40 years later. So you have to... Uh, Curiosity science. OK, yes. so uh, this is good for people who have uh, good ideas, who do not think about their careers. Because if you think about the career, you cannot do it. <laughs> and uh, you have to be patient. But, you know, if you start with the idea that you are going to get the Kavli Prize or the Nobel Prize, you are not going to get it. Very good. OK, so I'm going to just come... Because now, George, you are in the mix right from the start here. And you have an extraordinary reputation for bringing technologies uh, to market. What did you see in this at the beginning? Because you were originally uh, involved, uh, you two, working together. Well, one of the characteristics of chemistry is that it's a very sophisticated subject, which, as Jakob correctly points out, involves atoms reacting with atoms in mixtures of molecules. And I think Ralph and I have both been very interested in the question of what can be done that simplifies the task 
and makes it possible to do this with a different layer of control. And if you think about what has really changed the world in the last period of time, it's been the fantastic work that the largely commercial electrical engineers have done in making transistors and making chips and putting together large systems based mm -hmm. on that. But a new fab, new fabrication line, could well cost a billion dollars. And the machines that go in it could cost a hundred million dollars each. Yeah. And this is not something that chemists are going to be able to do. So one of the things that we've been interested in is how does one make this all simple? So one of my philosophies in science is if you have a good idea, the simpler you can make it, the more people can try it. <laughs> and the more people can try it, the more they have to contribute to the story. So the idea was could one develop a chemistry based on self-assembled monolayers which took the molecules already on the surface or designed the molecules to stick on the surface and use those, and then could you pattern that, as Jacob has pointed out? And what do you mean by pattern both. it? A transistor consists of a series of wires and plates, in essence. And so going from a broad surface, which is covered with the uniform monolayer film of an organic material, to something which is patterned, that is to say it has lines which ah. become wires and then other kinds of lines which become plates, this is patterning. Okay. So we're not making a uniform surface, we're making a surface that's highly structured in terms of where things are deposited. And so we worked out methods in part with Ralph about how to do that. This has been a very good collaboration involving the two of us because we tend to be what are called physical organic chemists, which are people who apply the principles of physical chemistry to organic complex molecules. And this has been an ideal field in which to carry out that kind of research because you take ordinary molecules, you put them on the surface, and they have properties which are a mixture of the old and the new. And based on the new, you can do things in terms of patterning, and based on the old, you can, can use the usual techniques for modifying surface properties and things of that sort. It's a very flexible field for bringing the idea of molecular transformation to the surface to selected small regions, and the small in the small regions is well below a micron now. Now, Danielle, we must mention Dave Valara here yes, because uh, Dave isn't able to be with us, but of course he was your, I'm going to call, call him a co-conspirator, but he was your, you were working both at Bell uh, Labs. Yes. And what made you think of gold? Because I guess that at Bell Labs, you were mostly concerned with copper, because at that time, you know, copper and its implications in, in, in telephone wires was there, there probably were, number one concern. There was a little bit of... Uh, of you copper know, mania. Well, I mean, you know, the phone company loved copper, you know, and, and the other thing that it really loved was polyethylene, you know, and, 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 and together, you know, they wired the planet for, for sound. And, yeah. Uh, um, you know, so there, there was a lot of work on, on, on metal organic interfaces in that context. Um, but the, the, the ideas that, that drove things towards gold as the first enabling substrate was really uh, based on on, on, the, on on the kinds of uh, principles that George was talking about, you know, physical, organic chemistry ideas, and um, and you know, and, and the way I looked at it, you know, we always had a, a paradigm of what we would call, you know, hard and soft interactions, which is kind of like an amorphous kind of con concept, I think, to most people, but it it, it, it it's the way certain. Um, elements tend to interact with other things, you know, that are predictive in terms of like how things might combine to, to, to react. And, and, the, and, and the reason why you go to gold is because, you know, most people know that that's like the one simple, you know, element that we know of that's easy to manipulate that doesn't form an oxide in the ambient atmosphere. And so if you want to take things out of ultra-high vacuum environments in order to be able to manipulate them in, in a complex, you know, chemical context, um, it has to be relatively inert against the background, mm. right? You know, and, 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 and standing in this, you know, we all had, had an experience, you know, with infectious organisms, you know, the background that we live in is not, you know, the most inert thing you know you can you know <laughs> envision. So so that was really why it went to gold, you know, because it was something that is relatively inert against the complex backgrounds in which we exist. 
George, where is all this going? What's next for self-assembled mon monolayers? For pattern self-assembled monolayers, I think probably Ralph is correct in suggesting that it was probably biology, because you can make structures which are small on the scale of the individual cell, and you can pattern half a cell and leave the other half unchanged. Mm. So there are many applications in that direction. But also, as structures become smaller and simpler, they are still a long way, a long way, from the scale that one can achieve if one works with the standard electronic procedures that are used to make chips, but they're much simpler. So it opens the opportunity for scientists of a wide variety to work both in pattern surfaces and in modified surfaces to see what they can find. And I think that what we will find is that it simply adds a tool kit to the standard armamentarium of things that chemists, biologists, material scientists, and others use to make matter. Hmm. And from that point of view, it has the potential to have a very broad impact, I believe, on, on natural science. And, and I, I'd, I'd like to add, like, in, in, a, in, a, in a real direct homage to Dave, who can't be here today. You know, I, I, I think the, uh, you know, the, the, the work that was done really brought out, you know, the, the, the powerful impacts of multimodal modes of characterization, um, you know, to understand complex systems, you know, and um, that was such an important part of the work that, you know, it can't be underestimated. Yeah. Um, what, how about you, Jacob? Where do you think uh, this is going? And what's, where are you going next with, with okay, this? Okay, we are, we are just in the middle of the action right now. Uh, it turns out that what we have been done, it was actually a succession of discoveries followed by inventions and new discoveries. What I mean discoveries? You are doing something, you get something unexpected. From the unexpected, you realize that something new and even more exciting than you could think about in advance happened. So for example, following George's philosophy, at the moment we are able to pattern the simplest and less expensive monolayer which is made from organosilence, the simplest compound, which is actually an insulator. It can be patterned on the nanoscale to make nanowires that are exceptionally good electrical conductors. And this happens at the interface. This is actually a discovery of my colleague sitting in the audience, Rivka Maoz. How to pattern this? Organosilene monolays that are inert surfaces by just doing organic, regular, classical organic chemistry, it is not possible. This happens only on the surface. On the surface, it is possible to change, to modify just the top atoms of this molecule that is highly organized on the surface at the interface with air. So, starting with a very simple compound, very inexpensive, we can make now highly conducting nanowires on the surface, and this is important because the effect of conductivity has to do with interfacial interaction between what you have on the surface and what is in underneath. In our case, underneath is, in this case, silicon, which is a semiconductor. With our molecules, we can actually make monolayers on a huge variety of different surfaces like glass, like silicon, it is possible to make them also on gold, although we're not competing <laughs> with this gentleman <laughs> and using gold. So uh, uh, what we right now realize that perhaps we may have effects of high temperature superconductivity super at this interface with the, our patterned monolayer. I'm not going to declare that we have and don't cite me, <laughs> no room temperature superconductivity, no but what we see suggests, highly suggests that this is the case. And of course, we are now in the process of uh, trying to make sure that what we see is real and is not uh, an artifact. And for this, we collaborate with people in condensed matter physics, those who are experts in analyzing what we have on the surface while we are experts in making the device or these nanowires that 
perhaps, as we believe, are going to lead us to high temperature superconductivity, which is actually the holy grail of condensed matter physics. And here the chemists can do what the physicists cannot do. Well, we're, we're, we're agog. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I want to ask you something, uh, uh, George Whitesides, because um, your lab is so well known around uh, the world particularly for uh, this thing about simplicity that you mentioned. And uh, simplicity is important not just in you know, how things are put together and how easy they are to do, but also because it gives them applicability in resource-poor settings. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you've been really dedicated to. Um, how has this work helped that vision of being able to help people in resource-poor countries? That has yet to come. And the underlying idea behind simplicity in science is that you can do sophisticated operations using relatively simple apparatus. And that works. And in fact, the history of science is in significant, but not exclusively exclusive part, smart people taking existing ideas and building on those existing ideas rather than starting from scratch and going from there. So what we have done, the group of those of us who are here, is to lay the foundation for a new way of doing synthesis or fabrication or assembly of complex structures. I think a number of other people will be prepared to do that as their skill in science develops, but it takes two to tango. And so you need both the technique and also the people who know something about it. And the combination of both of these is coming together now. So this is the right kind of thing if you're in less developed parts of the world. Um, because it is simple, it doesn't require the expenditure of hundreds of millions of dollars to get started. You don't take speculative flyers when you're spending that kind of money, particularly in developing countries. But so I'm very enthusiastic about it. And the same principles apply to things like paper diagnostics and you know, other areas of that sort. All of them, if possible, rely on the idea that instead of going to elaborate ends to force something to have a structure that you expect it to have beyond the scale of the molecule, it adopts that structure spontaneously because that's thermodynamically the way it's driven. Mm -hmm. And it works. It's, a, it's going to turn out to be a method that extends the scale of very small structures and very small synthesis to a variety of laboratories ranging from high schools to much more sophisticated operations in the developing world, which are looking for ways of doing it without spending a few hundred million dollars along the way. Hmm. Ralph, we, we've heard quite a lot throughout the day actually about sort of serendipity and um, the prepared mind. How, how important do you think serendipity is and that sort of prepared mind for science generally, but, but for your work too? You're talking about like in education and bringing young people forward. Yeah, and, and those sort of chance things that might happen when you're experimenting. Um, you know, right now, I'm, I, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about like what the last few years have, have done, you know, like in, in all kinds of complicated ways, you know. And so, um, and, and, you know, and, and, and the work of like so many people has been impacted in, in complex ways. Like, so, you know, the, the news in the United States is, is that, you know, progress in math capabilities have, have declined by like, uh, you know, an amount that's undone 20 years of progress in, in math really? education. Wow. Right. So I, 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 I think the thing that's like really important is, to, is like, you know, not only to figure out what kind of, you know, aid in place is needed urgently, you know, in terms of, you know, re remediating, you know, the impacts that have happened, um, but also, you know, this notion of like how to bring forward, you know, human talent, you know, as it's, as it's ubiquitously distributed along or around the planet, mm. you know, and, and, um, and, I, and I think that's one of the the real good things about about science when it's working correctly is is that you know it uh, will allow you know talent to come forward 
ubiquitously, you know, yeah. in, in, a, in a global population. And I think the area we work in is really nice because uh, it, it, it really is, you know, very democratic in, 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 that, in that sense that the, the barriers to entry um, you know, seem to be lower than something that, that requires a lifelong sophistication to begin to able to do something that's your own creative expression. I think an art museum is a great place to kind of look at that. You know, once you learn to put, you know, the, the white primer down on a, on, a, on a canvas, you know, you know, the blue and the red and the green, you know, follow kind of, uh, you know, more or less d d directly thereafter, and, you know, and, and I, I think that's, you know, you know, a nice analogy. Yeah. Really nice, yeah. Well, I think we've reached the end of our time with you, uh, and it, it's such a fascinating uh, area, and there's so much more to come from this. There's so much more to come. And it must give you enormous pleasure to see how it's developed. I mean, you know, more than 10,000 patents in this area. I mean, just what a flowering of technology there's been. And, you know, and, and we use so little money out of this. <laughs> Back to funding again. <laughs> Indeed. So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, oh, yes. please will you thank the winners of the Cavalier Nanoscience Prize 2022.